Hackers got caught exploiting WhatsApp supposedly and the chain they used is really, really interesting. So WhatsApp fixes a vulnerability used in zero click attacks. A zero click attack is this thing where an attacker can literally without any user interaction, get code control on your phone remotely. What makes it scary with an app like WhatsApp is WhatsApp is an application that allows you to receive messages from anybody. So a zero click attack in WhatsApp means that anybody who can send you a WhatsApp message can get code execution on your phone, steal your data and live in your device. It's a very scary place to be. Now, the actual vulnerability that got exploited here is not a vulnerability in WhatsApp. There is a vulnerability in WhatsApp, but it was changed together with another vulnerability in the entirety of Apple's image processing. A lot of really weird stuff going on in this chain. So WhatsApp security advisories, this came out in August of this year, but the, the bugs are recently getting changed together from a threat intelligence standpoint. Incomplete authorization of linked devices, synchronization messages in WhatsApp for iOS allowed a user that is unrelated to process content from an arbitrary URL on the target's device. When you have WhatsApp devices, right, these devices can be synchronized between, you know, your iPhone and your MacBook, for example, right? And the contents of those two things are synchronized, they're related. Now, because of an issue within WhatsApp, within the code base, there was a way, and I don't know the details of this, I think the WhatsApp security team is keeping it pretty, pretty quiet. There was a way for an attacker to make your computer process content from an arbitrary URL, which means that if it sent you an image, it would go download the image and view it. If you sent it a website, it would go run the code on the website, like the JavaScript, for example. Now, a bug like this isn't super interesting if there isn't an underlying vulnerability. If you actually look at the CVE for this, this CVE only got a 5.4 CVSS score, right? Which makes sense because like this in itself, this vulnerability that allows you to process content on a remote computer is not like the code execution that an, an elite hacker would want. They need to get this to work, another vulnerability in a parser that they can execute, right? Like for example, if I made your phone download a picture, wouldn't it be cool if I could also send you a picture that triggered a vulnerability in the image processing library? Well, this is exactly what happened in this vulnerability. So this bug got publicized around the same time that Apple submitted a patch for their image IO library. Now, like any good company that has to maintain code, that has to pay employees to keep a code base alive, Apple uses this thing called ImageIO, which is literally just a framework that the entirety of iOS depends on to parse and render images, right? When your phone or when any device that you use really, your browser, your computer included, when any of these devices encounter an image, it is required that they have to go and open the image and parse the image to figure out what to show you, right? And there's a lot of binary metadata inside these images that shows you different components of the image. Like even in a very simple bitmap, right? You have the BMP file, but it has elements in it like how big is the size of the image? How wide is it? How tall is it? And code somewhere in your phone or your computer has to read into this structure and pull all the data out and allocate memory and move pieces around to show you the graphics. And so for Apple, the image IO library is what does this, but just like anything, right? The image IO library is code and code like anything else can have vulnerabilities. And guys, while we can't stop zero days from happening, one thing we can do to stay ahead of cyber actors is to use today's sponsor, Flare. Flare is a threat exposure management platform that allows you to see if you or your company's personal data has been breached and talked about and sold from telegram leaks to info sealer malware, Flare has it all. Now I'm actually using Flare here to see if any of my business identifiers have been compromised. I have my email address here and I have low level academy put in here as well. I actually got a really scary event. I got sent to my email address. It said there's a medium credential leak on low level academy and the only low level academy email address that exists is my personal email address so i'm like oh is my is my site gonna get hacked now luckily for me unluckily for somebody else um what actually happened is somebody's computer got hacked that had a cookie for low level academy in it right well, what this means is that flair is constantly looking in these stealer logs and in these telegram chats and if any of the content they find hits your identifiers it will send you a notification kind of scared the crap out of me when it happened but it was good to know that Flare had my back and was watching out for me and sent me an email when something weird happened. And what's crazy is that Flare literally collects millions of events per day. On the 10th of September, they collected 12 million events. That's a lot of hacks. If you want to check and see if your credentials or sensitive data are hanging on the dark web, you can use my URL right here to get a 
free trial of Flare. Go check it out. Guys, the best way to support me on this YouTube channel or go to interact with the sponsors, go use their products and see if you can use them in your day to day. Thanks again, Flare, for sponsoring this video. Back to the video. And so enter the vulnerability here. This is CV 2025-43-300. It is an 1861 zero-click RCE proof of concept here. Again, the, the whole crux of this is zero-click RCE. What makes this even scarier than the WhatsApp bug, which is chained with this supposedly, is that if I were to show you, literally just present to you, uh, you on your phone via iMessage, via AirDrop, via web browser, this image, right? An image that takes advantage of a vulnerability in ImageIO, because your phone or your computer or whatever has to process that image, it is required to process that image, it will just automatically process the picture, take the code path that has a vulnerability and get code execution on your, on your computer, right? These kinds of parsing bugs are a hacker's wet dream, dude. They are absolutely insane. Now, obviously in a code base as not only complex, but as guarded as apples, right? They're extremely hard to exploit, but if a nation state or some other, you know, like NSO group type group can do it, then, you know, it's a scary place to be. So what is the nature of this vulnerability? Well, it all comes down to the raw camera bundle, a component within the image IO framework. It has to do with the DNG file format, a file, a file format that I'm actually, I didn't know existed until I'm working on this video. Uh, the DNG standing for digital negative, supposedly. It is an open lossless raw image format. So if you're not aware, a lot of image formats like PNG or JPEG, for example, are lossy, which means that when you have an image either via your camera or your image editor, those files are very large. Like a 4K image in raw is a ton of data. To pass that around on the internet, we made image formats that are compressed, meaning they compress down some of the information to a place where it's not necessary for you to see it. So the image is not uh, in its raw format, but it looks generally the same. Now for people that are doing either audio visual work or photography work, they need to have images that are lossless, which means that they don't lose any information. The reason why I'm highlighting this is because from the world of memory corruption vulnerabilities, from the world of finding bugs in software, it's very common for new bugs to be found in code that is less commonly used or less highly audited, right? I'm sure the image IO framework code for PNG or for bitmap, right? Two of like the biggest uh, image formats in, in the world are highly audited and highly taken care of. Whereas image IOs DNG or right, a format I haven't heard of until just now, may be less seen. So it makes sense to me that a bug was found here versus there. Now the group uh, Quarks Lab did an amazing write up on this vulnerability. I'm not gonna read through this. I'm not gonna like just do the, the article read thing for you. Please go to their, their write up, read it yourself. A lot of really good information here. I do wanna go over kind of like the main thing that they bring up in the uh, in the write up, which is like they read a pseudo code snippet of code that shows you the vulnerability and why it exists. Basically, because of the way that the DNG format works, there are multiple pieces that are called components and there are different things called samples per pixel. And there is a mix, a mismatch in the code between the actual number of components that exist and what is assumed by the code, right? So there, there's this code path you can go down that if the samples per pixel in the image is two, but the number of components is not two, it will automatically assume by this times two here, it should be a times number of components that there are two components, right? But because the buffer is not big enough, meaning it did not allocate enough room, it only allocated enough for one component and not two, when it goes to uncompress your image, it's gonna begin to write data for the image as it decompresses outside of the buffer. And this enables what is called an out of bounds write and a write that allows you as the attacker to put data somewhere on the computer that isn't in your control, right? This is like the hacker's wet dream, right? You either exploit, you know, a buffer that gives you control of the return address or the ability to put data elsewhere that you can take advantage of. And before you go and, and shit on Apple for like not testing their code, right? As the conclusion here says, image formats are tricky, vulnerabilities in parsers are not so uncommon and when they happen, they're usually very valuable. However, the image is processed when received, no user interaction is needed. You can send it via SMS, iMessage, et cetera. Like this is extremely common, right? The, the world of parsers where they take data from a user and have to render it or parse it. And the, the threat model is that anyone can send you this stuff. So they become a very common attack surface. The reason why I'm not surprised that another image format has a vulnerability in it, we had a bug uh, that got caught, the, the NSO group using, I think it was called BlastPass, right? The WebM bug from like two or three years ago. 
it's so hard to trigger these vulnerabilities in, in fuzz testing because a lot of them have these weird edge cases where you have to have certain parameters that meet a certain set of, of requirements. Like, you know, you have number of components is two, but samples per pixel is only one or vice versa. But also some of these depend on compression, right? So if you are trying to fuzz and create an image that is decompressing into a state where the program crashes, if you don't get the compression right, it's not gonna decompress properly and you're not gonna get the crash that you want. We actually had the same issue with the WebM bug from a while ago. So BlastPass was another vulnerability that was caught being used supposedly by the NSO group. The NSO group is an Israeli uh, intelligence firm that sells vulnerabilities. Um, and so what was happening is that this message got caught being sent around to an, an iMessage and they were sending people a WebM, a, a picture that exploited a vulnerability in the LibWebP project, a very widely used, kind of used by everybody um, image processing library, similar to ImageIO, but even worse because like this is used everywhere. This is used in Chrome, it's used in Firefox, et cetera, right? And so because of the way that the WebP format works, you have to have these things called Huffman trees, which basically encode compression information for the image. And when you're fuzz testing, right, you're doing coverage guided fuzzing and you're kind of randomly mutating data to figure out how far into the code graph you can get. But to exploit the vulnerability that BlastPass exploited, you had to create a very specific, very large Huffman tree that could not have been created randomly, right? There's no way to randomly test for this, which is why bugs like this didn't get caught. And similar to the digital negative format we're seeing for this vulnerability, it's just another issue where it's so difficult to randomly generate these images and have them be correct that you're likely going to miss edge cases in your fuzz testing. So at the end of the day, right, this vulnerability in DNG was being used to send to people on WhatsApp, and then the WhatsApp vulnerability would allow anybody to parse these URLs, and because of that, hackers were doing evil, nefarious stuff. It's a, it's a crazy world out there, guys. I love these kinds of bugs, not from like an attacker, like people getting hacked standpoint. It's just really interesting to see not only like two bugs getting chained and like company A seeing it and company B seeing it, but also like very sophisticated vulnerabilities where they're exploiting bugs and like image parsers. Like those to me are just really neat vulnerabilities. Anyway guys, um, on Friday of this week, in my next video, I'll make a video on the, the way that Apple plans on actually stopping a lot of vulnerabilities from happening in general. It's called Apple's Memory Integrity Enforcement. We'll see you in that next video. Goodbye.